Hey everybody, hello and welcome and thanks for joining us today. I'm Tony Corbell and, and this is all, all about light control for me. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed here as we do these more and more, we get a lot of notes, we get a lot of emails, we get a lot of texts, we got Twitter feeds going on left and right and people all want to know the same things. Uh, it's like five major topics that people want to talk about and working with Flash on location, working with Flash Outdoors is one of the most uh, most talked about and the most questions come from and people are so confused about it. Um, so we thought we would put together this, uh, this shoot and, and do this webinar based on that and, and talk a little bit about the controls. It's really, um, it's one of those things that you can make it as complex or as simple as you want and I think there's, there's tools designed to help you and they do get a little complex and hard to understand and then there are tools that are designed that just do what they do in, in, in a manual mode where you're in charge of everything and every aspect of it. So it all depends on you and your style and what you like to do, what your client wants you to do, what, you, what your personal taste is. But one of the things that's key, and you're gonna find this out from every single webinar that I do and every video I shoot and everything that I teach, and that is it's all about being in control. If you are out of control, uh, you're killing yourself with time in editing, post-production time, trying to save pictures, fix pictures, and you can't be out of control. And, and you know, I always, tell my, my friends and workshop attendees that uh, being professional doesn't mean you get paid for something. Being professional means you're proficient at your craft. And if you're not proficient enough to uh, understand that you get what you want every time you pull the trigger, then we've got some work to do still. So it's great to have a great eye, but it's not great to have a great eye and then not know how you got it or be able to repeat it. So that's what today's kind of about. Um, but what we're going to do first and foremost is, is go out to this wonderful ballpark and photograph this great uh, picture named Bobby Blevins. And Bobby's a terrific guy and you'll meet him shortly. When we leave today, maybe you'll have a little bit better handle on how to control flash and ambient in an outdoor situation especially, whether it's direct sunlight or in the shade or backlighting or whatever the situation might be. So I think we'll introduce that first video segment. Uh, so thanks again for tuning in. I hope this is, uh, proves to be a helpful day for you. Um, I love this stuff. As you, as you probably can tell by my personality and my energy when I'm out on location, I'm having the time of my life. Uh, when you get to a place like this, when you're shooting someone like Bobby on a location like this, uh, it's all about the client. It's all about making them happy. And, and there's something, too, I think that's a, that's a critical, important part of this which is you've got to be showing enough confidence that anything I ask him to do, he's going to do it because he, full, he fully has confidence uh, in my ability to pull it off, whatever it is that I want him to do next. So uh, let's take a look at our, our photo shoot with Bobby Blevins and, and are using our Bowen's Gemini lights on location with a battery packs. Hey everybody, here we are at the home of the Long Island Ducks out in Long Island, New York. Uh, photograph and picture Bobby Blevins and Bobby's just this great guy, he's a good looking guy, talented, well built, great picture and a great, great guy. Uh, so you know the thing about this is when you go on location like this, one of the biggest challenges is how do you get your power and especially on days like this where we've got sun moving in and out of these clouds, how do you deal with that light? Well the, the answer is you don't, you, you've got to overpower that light so we brought our strobes out. Over on the main light side, right of camera, I've got my 500 Gemini, and it's plugged into a travel pack, so I've got my battery with me, so I don't have to string extension cords all over this park. Uh, it's a beautiful park, and we want their cooperation, and they've been fabulous here. They came out and cut the grass for us this morning. They, they brushed and painted the pitcher's mound. They've really, they've really rolled out the red carpet for us. So because of that, it really makes you want to make sure that you're doing your best to get this shot done. Don't cause a lot of trouble and get out of the way. So we've got three heads. Our main light is an octobank, and that's just primarily lighting his face and giving us just the overall base exposure. Then I'm adjusting my shutter speed to take care of the contrast range. Then my two accent lights, and they're twin lights, come in forward, and those are with 500 units as well from Gemini, from Bowens, and they both have the 140 strip light. Now those are also powered about one stop below what I'm shooting at. So I'm getting the, the main light is overpowering the sun by about a stop then the strip lights are coming in at minus one. You know, I'm getting great, great results on his face, and that's my primary goal here, is that face. But with my shutter speed, I'm carrying the densities of the background. If you'll notice, I've positioned myself so I can see the scoreboard right behind him. 
with the home of the ducks on it. So it's really pretty a pretty simple shot to do. We've got several different locations and different things we're going to do while we're here. So hope this makes sense and, uh, and uh, happy shooting. You know, one of the things that I think I failed to mention in that segment was um, why, I, why I got down on the ground and was shooting ground level. And at first glance, it, you would think it would be because of the scoreboard in the background. Um, the scoreboard in the background was important. I did want to make sure we got the, the name of the team behind, behind Bobby. Uh, but primarily for me, the right camera angle is always the right camera angle in, in any picture you take. And so... Uh, if I'm photographing a child laying on his or her tummy on the ground, I've got to get down on the ground. If I'm photographing a bride and she's really, really tall, I might have to step up on an, on a, on an apple box or two. We've got to make sure that we still get in the right position. And for that picture with him leaning over on one elbow, the right picture was down at his level. So I had to get down. Uh, I didn't want a, the appearance of looking down on him. I wanted to make sure that I stayed right in there. And it's funny too, camera, you know, with camera perspective, and we'll jump into the light in just a second, but, but with, with lens perspective and camera controls, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that my work looks better if I stay up high when I'm doing a tight headshot, but as I back up, say I back up to do a, you know, more three-quarter view, then I can lower my camera down. And if, I, and if I'm doing a full length, I know that if I back up further and lower my camera down again, I keep the subject from having any converging or any convergence or divergence, I think I get a better look. So I think that if I'm photographing, like for example, if you guys are shooting weddings, if you're photographing a bride full length, consider putting your lens at the same height of her bouquet, keeping it down low. And I think you'll like your, your full lengths a little bit better, especially if you're shooting with a shorter lens. Um, but one of the first questions is, uh, how do you take readings of the direct sunlight before you turn the flash on and read this, the flash? Well, if I'm in direct sunlight, uh, I almost never have to take a direct reading of the sun. I know the direction. I know the direction of the light, and I know what the brightness is of the sun on a bright sunny day anywhere in the world. And it's really silly. It goes back to that old sunny 16 rule, um, which is on a front lit subject, if the sun is more than 20 degrees above the horizon, the exposure will always be exactly the same. And what I do is, is, is it's ISO 125 at shutter speed 125. So the ISO and the shutter speed have to match and the aperture is F16. So basically that was my exposure for out there. It's, it's, it's the sunny 16 day and then I just bring up the flash to match that output. Does that make sense? Um, for me, I think it seems to make the most sense. Um, one of the questions came in, um, so where can I get the weight bags for the life stands? You can buy those everywhere. You can use, i tell you what I used to use for years and years. I would have a little piece of rope and I would have three or four rolls of black gaffer tape. That's as heavy as a weight bag and I would just hang my gaffer's tape on the end of my life stands and it works great. Uh, some people use the ones that you can fill with water or sand because they're so portable and you can take them to the beach with you, for example, empty and you don't have to carry all the weight down to the beach. Then you pack them in with sand and then hang those on your light stands. And when you finish, you unzip them, pour out the sand, and you're out. So that's a pretty good one too. Uh, but all the camera stores sell them. You can just, you know, just I would say Google photographic weight bags and, and you'll find weights everywhere. So it's, they're pretty easy to find. Um, so the question is, so you found out the exposure of the sun first and then set the light. I did, and that's exactly the, the, the right thing for me to do. I've always been in the mindset that in any location situation, there's always something that's a constant, that, it, that will remain constant, that I have to sort of shoot to that one constant. Let me give you an example. Um, I photographed a, a, a general manager of a wonderful, wonderful steakhouse in North Carolina called the Angus Barn. If anybody's in North Carolina, you've heard of this place. It's called the Angus Barn. And I photographed the general manager down in a basement. They've got a vault room. It's a private dining room downstairs. And I walk down there and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to light this thing. And I looked around the room and there are candles 
all down this one wall and all down this wall. So there's like five candles on each side. Well, I know that the exposure for candles, I know that the flame on a candle at ISO 400 is about 60th at 5.6. So I know that's why I'm, I'm stuck at that exposure because the candles I can't change. That's my constant, right? So at the ballpark, the sunlight lighting the background, lighting the, the scoreboard, lighting the grass, all of that, that's my constant. I can't change that, so I've got to go to that. I hope that makes some kind of sense. In a, in a portrait situation where I'm not so concerned about the background brightness, I'll change my shutter speed accordingly uh, to make it a little brighter or a little darker depending on my taste and the mood of the subject and what she's wearing or he's wearing or what we're trying to say with the picture. But, but for the most part, I've got to be very, very cognizant of my ambience or the one thing that I shouldn't change or can't change in that one constant. And on that day, it was the ambient light, so that's exactly right. Uh, I did let it go a little dark, so when you say uh, at the end of your question, so then I set the light one stop more, I set the aperture to match the aperture of the ambience. Then I changed my shutter speed according to my taste and what I needed for the day. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, if you're by yourself and you don't have an assistant and you only have two minutes with the subject, what do you use for a preparatory metering before the subject gets there? Or do you wait until the subject arrives? I do not wait until the subject arrives. You're, you're right. When you don't have any time and you're by yourself, you better be prepped so that when he walks onto the set, you got to be able to shoot this thing, bam, 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 and out he goes. Uh, your, clients, your clients would probably, I think, I would venture to say, pay you better, pay you more, and allow you to do a better job if you can get your talent in and out quicker. In other words, if I spend a half a day with an executive, I'm going to get one certain reaction to that. But if I, can, if I can take that same guy and I respect his time and get that shot done, get the job done in five minutes or four minutes and get him out, they're going to love me even more because I was respectful of the time. Uh, and sometimes it's outside influences like, you know, crowds showing up and people are coming in the stadium and you got to get out the floor or get out of the, out of the field. Um, but yeah, so if you're by yourself and you're doing all that, everything that I'm doing is working with remotes. So with my remote controls, I can certainly fire off my lights and test them uh, prior to my, my client walking in. Once my client walks on the set, I shouldn't have to wait or spend a lot of time. Uh, it should be a pretty simple thing. And you know, we've, you, if you guys have watched here and tuned in before, you know that every time I use my light meter, it's the same thing. I don't, I don't change how I use my meter. My meter is exactly the same. I almost always put my meter right under my subject's chin and aim it toward the primary source, the main light or the key light. I almost always have a perfect exposure when I do that. So why, do I, why would I want to do anything other than that? I know people that will argue that and say, well, have you tried it this way and have you tried it that way? I've been doing this 34 years. I've tried it every way possible. But I know that my exposures are dead on when I aim that dome or that sphere right at my main light. And if I just do what it says, I can't get in trouble. And so that's one thing I don't have to think about anymore. That's one tool that's in my tool bag that I do the same way every time I take a picture. So it seems to work. Um, so you found the exposure. So you found the exposure of the sun first and said, "Yeah, okay." Uh, do you purposely do the shoot on the mound to avoid the green cast off the grass? <laughs> I'm not sure who it was that asked that question. If it's one of my knucklehead friends, but uh, I didn't do it purposefully. But after I started the shoot, I thought. Oh, this is good. I don't have to worry about putting down a white sheet. Because in, usually if I'm in a park, if I'm photographing someone in a park with beautiful green grass, I almost always do have to be concerned about those green shadows. That It's not a green cast so much in their skin, but it will be a green cast in the shadows. So I'll throw down a white sheet on the ground to sort of block that out, or a black sheet if you want to put on black on the bottom, but you've got to get rid of that bounce coming up. A white just helps give you a little bit extra fill off the ground. But you are absolutely right. That's a great catch on your part. Uh, the brown grass, I mean the brown dirt on the mound prevented any kind of a influence of color. So that was a, that's a real great point you made. So great question, great, great comment. Do I use ratios? Yeah, but I don't think about ratios the way a lot of people think about ratios. Uh, I'm not too concerned with the ratios of light as much as I'm concerned about does the picture uh, tell the story about my subject in the, in the best manner or in the best light, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, people that get caught up in ratios sometimes 
lose sight of taking a good picture. I'm not sure if that computes uh, or comes across properly, but uh, I, I know for me, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot of people that are really, really great face photographers, beauty and fashion photographers uh, that don't ever give the word ratios another thought. Their job is to make a face look great, and they'll do whatever it takes. It's either a high ratio or a low ratio. They don't care. What do they have to do for the job, for its intended purpose or use, and does the face just look great? The face has to look great, and that's, and that's of the most key importance. If you miss that, you've missed the picture. And so I really don't get caught up too much in the ratios uh, because it, first off, will do two things. It'll slow me down. It'll make me try to do math while I'm trying to stay in, in touch and keep my communication with my client. So I'm, I probably wasn't thinking too much about ratios. Uh, it's nice to have that, and it's nice to keep that in mind. Uh, in the shooting, the baseball scene, after your meter, would you, would you do a custom white balance? Um, I, I would probably do one. I would probably put a uh, color checker uh, in the scene, uh, but it, mo mostly just to test it. My, my daylight balance is pretty accurate on my camera, and it's pretty dialed in with my flash meter and my flash. So I'm, I'm pretty accurate uh, with my color balance. Uh, in fact, when I first finished this shoot and looked through all the, all the and I transferred everything into Lightroom, uh, everything was dead on. My exposures were dead on. My color was dead on. Uh, those were things that I did not have to, have to edit. So I, I always like it when I don't have to edit much. Um, uh, one more, the, the only other thing is, uh, why, did you use, why did you choose to use the strobes and the octobank instead of a speed light? You know, there's a lot of this kind of work that you can do with a speed light. Uh, with a speed light, you're very limited, though, in your output. You're limited on your choice of, of light shaping devices and still having the ability to work at a high uh, aperture, a small aperture. If you need to shoot at 11 or 16 or 22 and you need a large, you know, five or six foot octobank with a speed light, sometimes that's a, that's a hard one to get to. Uh, Sync speed is always an issue for some people. Not everybody has the ability to do high-speed sync, and high-speed sync is a great tool for some flash units, and it's not available on all. So there, there's a few issues with speed lights out in direct sun. Uh, I love the I love where speed lights have come from, uh, and and their their technology that's built into speed lights is pretty phenomenal these days. It's very confusing for a lot of people, and especially new people. It's very very confusing. And sometimes they just throw their hands up and then list themselves on their website as a natural light photographer because they just don't, they don't know how or don't want to learn to take the time to try to figure out this maze of menus inside their new speed lights. Um, but yeah, so that'll, that, should, uh, that should be something to think about, though. I mean, if, if the light level were really low in the day, late in the day, low, low skies, dark, dark backgrounds, then I could probably pull this off with a speed light. But overcoming the sun is kind of a challenge sometimes. So, great questions. Really good comments. Um, let's go ahead uh, and uh, let's roll the second segment. You guys ready over there? I want to say thanks to this crew. We've got a crew of people in here you can't see that these people are making everything work behind the scenes. And they do a great job and uh, they make it all look good and feel like it feels right and sounds good and all that. So, thank you guys. So, okay, let's roll the next video segment and, uh, and we'll be right back with you. Now we're off of the grass and we're in the dugout. This is, this is the place where so many of these ball players spend so much of their time. And I thought this is an ideal place to shoot. And I know that varying my shutter speed is going to be the key, working with flash, uh, working with studio strobes here. Uh, the, the main light is an octobank and then I've got another light in the background. So those are going to be my two key, key light sources for this segment. When I'm on location, I don't think of my pictures any different than I do when I'm in the studio. I still have a main light, and I still want it generally 45 or so to my camera, but not always. But, but generally, it's going to be off camera, and it's going to be off to an angle, creating uh, direction. I'm always going to have an accent light or a background light or some other light that's helping to give me some dimension to my picture. And so in this case, I know I'm going to have at least two lights. So I've got the, the main light from this Octobank. My strip light back there is acting as a background light. In this case, it's just opening up that whole corner for me. Uh, and then I've got a fill light that is unseen, and that is the ambience. As I slow down my shutter speed, 
my ambient light starts filling in the shadows more. So I've got a built-in soft sky that's, that's my fill light. So I think of it in that term. I don't, I don't really distinguish when I'm on location versus when I'm in the studio. My tools might be different, how I approach the shot might be different, but I'm gonna key in on my lighting pretty much the same. And that's just the way I sort of think. You know, again, working with Bobby is a treat. I mean, you can see this guy, he's just, he's just pleasant. <laughs> he's just really nice. And most athletes are, uh, at least early in their careers. I remember photographing an NFL player who shall remain nameless his rookie year, and he was a Dallas Cowboy. And his rookie year, he was so nice and pleasant, he would just do anything for you. And then I photographed him the year he retired, and he was such a jerk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's not going to happen here, though, because Bobby's a good guy. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the challenges with this picture, with the dugout picture, is that that dugout faced north. What that means is that dugout has beautiful, beautiful light in it all the time. And so I didn't have to light. I didn't have to use the light. In fact, if you look at the light on my face uh, during the videos when I'm sitting there on the bench, uh, there's great light quality. Um, but the introduction of the flash gives me the ability to separate the subject and the background. And it just kind of sharpens things up and gives things a bit of a hit of contrast that, that are comfortable. And, and it gives me some more options for my client to choose from. So that's, that's basically that. And, and colors, I think colors tend to pop a little bit better when I can use a strobe in an ambient situation like that. So a lot of questions on this one. Um, first one, would a 640 watt second strobe be strong enough? The answer is absolutely. Uh, plenty. In fact, the ones that I had were only 500s. Uh, I also have some 400 kits, the little RX 400s from Gemini, the little two head kits. Those little 400 kits are so bright. They're terrific. And they're very, very inexpensive. Um, what about the use of umbrellas? Umbrellas are great. And I use umbrellas a lot. What I can't do with umbrellas, uh, what I can do with softbox that I can't do with umbrellas, I can keep the light contained right where I want it. Umbrellas will send light everywhere. And what that means is sometimes umbrellas will also send light to the ground where I might not want it uh, or at the base of the picture where I might not want it. So that's all. Just be mindful that umbrellas uh, are a little bit harder to control, but they're terrific to use. They are not a soft source. They might appear soft because they light a large area, but they're not soft. They're a smaller source and they're a little bit sharper edge shadows. So just be mindful of that and you'll be okay. Uh, why meter toward the main light and not toward the camera? The, this question I get every time I take a picture or ever teach anything. Uh, for me, the, the, the definition of an illuminance meter, also known as an incident meter, is designed to measure light as it strikes or falls on your subject. Okay? So what that means is any, it's, it's to measure the light that falls on my subject. If I'm... Let's say here's my camera. I'm looking at the video camera here, my main camera. That's my camera and I'm the subject. And if my main light is over here, if I aim the dome straight at my camera, half of that dome is in light and half of it's in shadow. So I'm getting some light and some shadow. So it's averaging between the two. But it's not giving me the light that's falling on my subject. It's getting me half the light that's falling on my subject and half the shadow that's falling on my subject. So by turning it toward the main light, now I'm reading all the light that's falling on my subject. That's what its job is. Um, I know that for many, many, many years, I shot exactly that way, where I'm shot with my dome aimed back at the camera. And I got away with it fine in the film days, in the negative film days. I couldn't do it with transparency film. I could with negative film. Um, and I can get away with it with digital, too, on one condition, and that condition would be if my main light is within 45 degrees of my camera. But if my main light is a little further away than that, then I've got to measure it straight to that light source. So for me, 
I just go straight to the light source every single time and I can't get in trouble. So it just works. And everything falls into place. I think of my incident meter in that manner. When I aim the dome of that meter at my light source, I always think of that as my reality meter. So a reflective meter, looking through your camera meter, your spot meter, a Sologar one degree spot, whatever you're doing with a reflective meter, that's a meter that's measuring a value relative to 18%. But your incident meter in the dome of an incident meter, that's your reality meter. And whatever it says, if you do what it says, your exposure will be dead on. And you just won't miss. And so for me, that's why I do it that way. Um, I love your block for the light stand. <laughs> is that just foam? How adjustable is it for different heights? All that was was an apple, an apple box that we had on the set. And uh, we, we, we happened to, in fact, our video guy, Dan, who happened to just think, oh, we ought to take some apple boxes with us. And I'm so glad he did because right where I wanted to put that light, that leg was hanging out in space. I'm like, crap, I need something that's about two feet high. And he went, here, <laughs> and stuck an apple box in there. So it was perfect. No, it wasn't foam. It's, it's, it's made out of wood. Uh, and you can buy those. You can buy apple boxes pre-made so you don't have to make them yourself. But it's good to have hand handles in there and those holes to, to be able to move them around and carry them. And they're really great to have around the studio. Uh, often I'll, I'll use a short one that's even four, five, six inches high when I photograph uh, models because I want to get up just a little bit higher sometimes. Uh, and I don't want to stand on a small ladder. It's just too confining. So it works out pretty well. Uh, I noticed that you're using a 7200. Would you rather use a prime lens for portraits like an 85 or a 105? Great question. Uh, I, have a, I have an 85 and I have a 105. Uh, what, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I switched into the world of Canon a year and a half ago from a previous life with another brand. And when I got that 7200, it was a recommendation from one of the Canon guys said, you know what, don't, don't get the 7200 2.8, but pick up the 7200 f4 and test it and see what you think. And I tested that lens, and at every working aperture that I, that I usually work at, uh, that, that lens is crazy sharp. And having it that crazy sharp gives me, and, and having that kind of wide variety, uh, I'm not going to say it's better than an 85 prime or a 105 prime, but I can tell you that I can move quicker and get more work done in a day because I'm using it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of sold on it, and, and I've got those primes, and I haven't used them in a while. Uh, and I'm a guy that came from the Hasselblad world where I never used zoom lenses uh, until we made the transition to DSLRs. So I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of sold on this 7200 lens right now. So um, I know that that's a that's an argument for some. <laughs> Um, did you test both lights that you used with your light meter? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, test, I test everything. Uh, and like, a, like in the previous segment, usually before the client comes on the set, I'll have tested everything. Uh, certainly I know these lights real well now. I've been using Bowen's lights for quite a, quite a long time now, and I understand their, their color balance. I understand their recycle time. I know their power output. I know that I can walk onto that set, put that, that bank up there, the Octabank, that close to Bobby, and I know I can dial in that power down to number three and be pretty darn close to what I want to shoot at because I just know the output now. Uh, their, their output is very, very true and very, very accurate, and uh, I'm just blown away at the quality that I'm getting at an affordable price. It's not a price that's cost prohibitive. So, um, Okay, so any other questions? I didn't see anything else. I, I did want to make one comment. There was one question that we put down sort of to hold toward the end. Uh, how many different shots do you plan for an assignment like this? Um, I really, I really don't. You know, it's funny. I, uh, it's funny. You'll know when you have it, and then the rest is sometimes for show if it's a paying client. Uh, I recently did a series of uh, of uh, lighting videos for Kelby training for Kelby One, uh, which you'll see they they'll, they'll go live next month. Um, and it's interesting, the last shot, we, we did a group, a family of five, then we did a, a dance studio of six, then we did uh, eight firemen, then we did a group that was bigger, then, and we built up to bigger and bigger and bigger groups till finally the last shot of the, of the day, of the week, for the video, is a shot of the, the Kelby a Photoshop user, Photoshop TV, Photoshop World's uh, entire staff, and there's 87 employees. And... When I shot the first shot, I got it. 
And so, but I couldn't just stop with one picture. We had 87 people that stopped what they were doing and came together and we made this big picture and it took a little time. So I kept shooting a lot more for variety uh, and just for them. And, and maybe I might have to swap a couple of heads in the group who people might turn away, something like that. But, but for the most part, we nailed it first time out. And that's the beauty and the confidence that you can gain in your abilities once you do know your color balance and once you are trusting your meter and you are trusting the, the, your, your confidence and, and also that the client's confidence in you is being trusted. I, with Bobby, I could have shot five pictures on each of these three different sets that we're doing and been fine. Uh, and I would have been able to get exactly what my client wanted. We shot a little extra uh, and we got a little bit more variety. Uh, but not, not that it was absolutely necessary. Uh, once you get a look and you know that look and everybody signs off on that look and you're happy with that, that's great. If you're a high school senior photographer, you might shoot eight or 10 or 12 different poses and you might shoot three or four of each of those poses to produce more for your client to view. Well, that's fine if you do that, keeping in mind that they can't buy everything. So that's where album sales come in, you know. Um, so anyway, um, what was the usage for this picture? This, this was a personal picture for Bobby to start with, but now it looks like the team's going to use it for something. So that was the, the usage of the, of the photo. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's going to be pretty great. Are the pocket wizards built in for the model? I missed the opening. Yes, they are. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. The pocket, pocket wizard module is plugged in to the back of all the Bowen's heads. And then I'm just using one transmitter on my camera, the yellow one. Um, which I'm pretty great about, which I'm pretty happy about. Okay, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're kind of caught up. Let's go ahead and move on to the next segment. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we're good on time. Let's go to the next segment, and then I'll go through. We've got a few more extra questions in here, uh, and we'll save some time at the end for those. So let's go to the next section, um, and, and this, is a, this was an interesting shot that I hadn't planned on doing. And so follow along and see what you think about this one. Thanks again, everybody, and just stay tuned for just a couple more minutes with us. You know, when we showed up at this location, I had three distinct shots in mind, and I had drawn, drawn them out on paper and sent them to the crew, and we talked about how we were going to light every shot. Things always change. I got here, and I didn't like shot number two, and I didn't know what to do about it when I walked up. But as I walked up to the concourse and saw this view of the field, I thought, this is our shot. I've got to be able to light him from here accent him from there and be able to see and perfectly balance that sky with what's going on under, under here. So think about this, he's completely covered under this overhang for this picture. So I'm filling the light, I'm backlighting him basically from all the ambience. So I'm exposing for the ambience. So I got perfect exposure on all those signs and on the grass, the grass looks great, the clouds, the sky. And so what we're trying to do is bring in this light and balance to what's going on on the field. So we took our meter reading and it gave me a two hundredth of a second at f11. That gave me the proper balance at ISO 100. So all I had to do then is bring up my flash until it reads f11 on my main light. Once I got to 11 on the main light, that was it. My two accent lights are both set at a little bit below that. So this one is about a half a stop below that and that one over there is about a third of a stop below. It's at a greater distance because of the jockeying around of light stands in the stadium seating. But this is a great, great location to work in. And this is something really to think about when you're asked to do these things. Your client will follow your lead. So when you walk in there, they may say, we want you to do a photo, just, to, just do a quick headshot of one of the athletes. Okay, great. Except that there's probably three or four good headshots of the athlete. And these are environmental portraits. We've got to be able to see the environment. And so you guys as professionals have to direct the shoot and people will follow your lead. Your client will follow along. If you're still strongly about, you know what, that's not gonna work. I can shoot that for you, but I think you're gonna like it if I shoot it over here or shoot it this way. And that often happens. If you feel strongly about it, they'll go for it. They'll have full consideration for whatever suggestions you have. You know, it's always a great thing being a photographer when you, when you get asked to go on location. 
because you, you always find these great surprises. And uh, we're very fortunate that we get to see a lot of places and meet a lot of people. Uh, today working with Bobby Blevins here at the stadium, the, the ballpark for the uh, Long Island Ducks. This is just a beautiful place. But when you're asked to come on location like this, you got to make sure that you have the right gear with you. For me, uh, I knew we needed to work with battery packs uh, so I don't have to have extension cords, 300 feet worth of extension cords. So everything's battery packs today uh, and we're getting lots and lots of uh, good output, solid output. And we're paying attention to the two things that I hit hardest in my workshops and my and my blog posts and everything I do, which is like quality and like quantity. If I can concentrate on those things and understand all their controls, I can't miss as a photographer. Just be sure that you can perform on demand, that what you see is what you get, and, and that there's no surprises. If you can do that, you're gonna have a long career, your clients will refer other people to you, and you're always gonna have great relationships with your, with your clientele, and, and you'll enjoy your craft as well. So, hope that helps, and uh, happy shooting, everybody. You know, as I wrapped up there, I was talking a little bit about how, how fortunate we are, and, and we are. We get to do a lot of great stuff. Um, I, I feel blessed every day, and I can't believe the, the fortune that has smiled on me, uh, where I've really literally gotten to travel the world, and I've photographed some of the biggest names in the world, and po political leaders, and athletes, and astronauts, and different people, and it's just been an amazing thing that we get to do. Uh, but I think the thing that helps us and propels us forward is uh, being so professional about it. And, and that means we don't guess. That means we don't test nonstop in front of our client. We don't take a picture and then look at the back of our camera and go, huh, let's do that again. We don't shoot another one and then look at the back of our camera and test. We don't do that in front of our client. We, do, we get that but done before they ever show up. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's, so there's some great questions that came in after this segment. This was just a fun segment for me, I thought. And... Uh, uh, do I have, did I have a complete setup ready at each location? I did not. That was the same lights and we just moved them all over the park. Um, what about using reflectors or shoot through screen for softer lighting? You can do that. Um, you just have, you, you give up some control when you use reflectors in an ambient light situation and there are certain things that you can't do. For example, it's very, very difficult to bounce off of a reflector. It's very difficult to bounce soft light. You can bounce hard light but it's very difficult to bounce soft light. And sometimes you, your reflector, you're, you're fighting the reflector all day. And for me, I need to get the shot done as quickly and with as little amount of trouble as possible. And sometimes that means I need to take a little extra equipment with me. Um, what if you want to keep the subject sharp focused but blur the background? Do you tend to use a telephoto lens? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I, I, uh, I'll often try to get away with the longest lens I can. And, uh, and to answer that question specifically, Absolutely, I love working with a with a with a background with very very little uh, sharpness to it. Um, so yeah, you can power those. You can power everything down, and and that's another thing. If you can't get the power low enough to open up to a two eight or an f four or five six or whatever you might want, and you just can't power it down enough, great. Use neutral density. You can use neutral density on your camera. You can use neutral density gels on your lights. You can you can gel down and power down everything and then open up for that loss, and then you're getting the, the out of focus uh, blur that you're after. But a lot of people don't realize that, that you can buy in those little sample gel packs, you can buy those with neutral density gels where there's no shift in color, it's just a density shift of a third stop, two third, one stop. So you can buy those all day long and they're very, very handy to have on set. Um, when aiming the light meter at the light source, would it just be too much difference versus aiming at the camera? wouldn't both just work, wouldn't both work? And the answer is, yeah, they would, it would work as long as that light was within 45 degrees of the camera. If that light is more than 45 degrees away from the camera, there's gonna be a big difference. Um, and, and it could be as much as or more than a third of a stop. Well, a third of a stop can often be enough to put you into a uh, situation where you're, where you're pegging a, a, a histogram. And, and you're starting to lose that, that detail. I can't lose detail in my highlights. I just can't do it. So, you know, I, I'm, I try to be real on top of that, and I really kind of watch that. Um, I can just tell you this. If you'll trust me on this and go spend an afternoon out testing and testing and testing, what you'll find is if there's your light, there's your camera, there's your light source, and if you just keep moving your light over and over and over and you just keep metering it to the camera, 
then run the next series of tests, aiming the meter at the light and test it, test it, test it, test it, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, and look at, look at the runs. Look at, look at the, the variations of exposures. You're going to love the ones where you aim the light at, I mean the meter at the light. It's just consistency for me. It's just a, it's a, it's a confidence and a consistency. So, um, can you ever be too efficient and not appear to take enough time with a subject so a client thinks you're not worth the money? What a, what a great question. I got a story for you. I got a story for everything because I've been doing this too stinking long. But I showed up for an annual report shoot for Shell Oil one year. And I was supposed to photograph this guy in his office, president, and they blocked off three hours for the shoot. So my assistant, we pull up in front of the building, we jump out of the car, and we pull everything out of the car and set it in the lobby. Uh, while it's all coming out and unpacking it all, I jump in the elevator, grab my camera, and throw it over my shoulder and tell my assistant, I'm going to go up and tell them we're here. So I go up to the office. The secretary comes out and says, our assistant comes out and says, he's running way late and he's got to get to a meeting. And about that time, he came out of the office and he said, how fast can we do this? And I said, we can do this right now. And I walked into his office. Now, here's the beauty. Most presidents of most companies have a window that's on a corner. That's great news for me because I have two light sources. I got a light source for a main light and I got a light source for an accent, which will separate dark suits and the shoulders away from the backgrounds. So I was able to do this with ambient light. I shot 10 frames, bam, 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 bam. I was done. He was out. I was on the elevator and I was back in the lobby. And as the, as the elevator opens, there's my assistant with his hand full of gear about to load it on. We'd already finished the shoot. And I said, we're done, let's go. And he went, what? <laughs> and so, but to answer the question is, do I charge my client less because I'm an efficient enough photographer that I was able to pull that off to a high degree and produce for them high quality work? Should I be penalized because it took me less time? Or should I be rewarded because I know what I'm doing? So you have to ask, you have to ask that question of yourself. I know that I charged them a certain amount of a day rate for that job. I didn't change my billing just because I had it done in a quicker period of time. I don't charge by the hour. I either charge a full day rate or a half day rate for, for me and my time. And if I can get it done quicker, my client wins. Uh, I should still be paid the same because I blocked off the whole day for this job. But mostly it won't take that long. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so one of the questions that popped in was, do I ever use TTL? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but pretty sparingly. Uh, TTL can get fooled. Uh, I can tell you the new 600 X, RX, XRTs, RTX, whatever they're called, the new Canon stuff, those are ridiculously accurate. And so are Nikons too, I'm not saying that they're not. Uh, most of technology of today is pretty accurate for, for the world of TTL. But you have to remember, here, here's the thing about TTL that everybody forgets. TTL is based on that flash firing bouncing off of your subject, going through the camera lens. TTL means through the lens and hitting a sensor next to your camera's sensor. When that light reaches that sensor, when it, see, when it sees a mid value or a equivalent of 18% gray, it turns off the flash. Okay, that's great as long as you're photographing everything of a mid value all day long. But if I'm photographing a bride dressed in white or if I'm photographing a groom dressed in black, my exposures are gonna be all over the place if I don't compensate for those. So in those situations, it might be better off to just shoot manually, I think. Uh, and you don't have to meter every shot. Meter one time and put a cheat sheet on the back of your flash, you know? At 10 feet, at quarter power, at this ISO, I am at F8 or F11. Do it that way and put a, put a little chart at full power, half power, quarter power, eighth power, sixteenth power, at, at seven and a half feet, less than, I would say seven and a half feet, ten feet, and fifteen feet. Here are my values. Great. They'll always be the same if it's a manual. They'll never vary. And with TTL it will vary a little bit. Um, talk about the battery packs. Yeah, the battery packs uh, that I use, the travel packs, uh, I've, had, I've had great success with them, and I've seen that they, the battery seemed to last a very, very long time, much longer than I anticipated. Uh, we did a, a shoot, a walk through Central Park, a kind of a photo walk a few months ago, and we shot from 9 a.m. till noon, walking all over Central Park with a model and a group of photographers, and we were all passing around 
uh, wireless transmitter, the pocket wizards, and we shot all morning. Well, when we got to the restaurant at lunch and we were finished for the day, I said, how's that battery pack? And one of the guys looked at it and said, wow, this thing's still on full. I was blown away. Now, we weren't at full power. We were way down in power. But still, <laughs> it lasts a long time. So I've, I've become a fan. I, I, I didn't think I was going to be a fan of the travel packs, but I am. Uh, and I know that there's some things, some updates coming too. So we'll see how that goes. Um, Great question. At least once a year, I have to shoot a large group, 80 plus, in a sunny environment. I use a travel pack and a 750 watt second. Uh, I need all the power I have in that one light. It's for fill only. Due to the direction of the sun, my question is, which would give me more coverage, a wide angle reflector or a 60 inch reflective umbrella? They're going to give you, uh, the coverage is not the issue. The issue is going to be the output. Uh, I think the, that the wide angle reflector is going to give you a better, uh, a better light in terms of just a, a burst of light. And I think you'll be able to, to send it to the back rows of your group better. But for me, I, I do love working with an umbrella with groups. And, and with a group that size, I would use that. I could even overpower the sun and use that as a main. Maybe even if, if the timing right, is right and if the environment and background allow it, maybe turn them with the sun at their back. Let the sunlight be their accent and light their shoulders then light maybe with two umbrellas in the front or three umbrellas in the front and then fill that way as, and, and then don't set them as fills but set them as mains. Uh, that might work as well. So, you know, it's, it's an option. But I would, I would test, uh, I would go outside in my backyard if I were you and shoot the 60, in, the 60 degree or the 60 inch uh, reflective umbrella and the wide angle reflector and set them both up and set a few objects out there. Set a tripod up and a light stand up and put something on them and and do a couple of tests, you might be surprised at how well the, the wide angle reflector covers. It covers a lot, so it does well. And it doesn't really take too much light away. Uh, could you talk about dragging the shutter, daylight versus evening? Yeah, dragging the shutter uh, is, is another element of control. And if you think about it, I, when I step into the world of flash and ambience, I have three possible shots in my head, and that is, the only, the only reason I use flash outdoors is for one reason, and that is to control the background brightness. That's it. So with that said, I have three options. I can make the background look like the background's supposed to look. I can make it brighter than it's supposed to look, or I can make it darker than it's supposed to look. Okay, so in my brain, I've only got three options. So when I walk onto the set, I look around and go, oh, this is great. Oh, I need to darken, darken that background to get rid of this. Or for drama based on what the model is wearing, I need to do this. Or how it's going to be used. Oh, it's going to be used in this uh, two-page spread in a ladies' home journal, and it's a light, airy issue. Then I need to lighten the background a little bit. Great, then I need to use this. So, so my decision will be based on what the usage is. But I have those three different options. Uh, for me, it works great. Dragging the shutter, th the only reason to drag the shutter is to increase and elevate the brightness in my background. What's the opposite of dragging the shutter? Closing down the shutter, increasing the shutter, which makes that background darker. It's just a great element of control. So dragging the shutter, I drag it all the time. Uh, it just depends on the use of the shot and what the shot's supposed to feel like and, and the mood that I'm trying to establish. Um, okay, so we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Let me keep going. What are the rim lights doing when you have such a bright background like this? They just give me a little extra kick of light that I can control. Sometimes I don't need the, the, the kicker lights, the accent lights from behind, the rim lights from behind. Sometimes I do. Uh, it just depends on the brightness and, uh, and it also will kind of help depend on what the model's wearing. If they're wearing dark clothes, sometimes I don't like what the rim light's giving me and I want to just pop it a little bit more and I use a, a rim light for that. Um, how many full pops can you get out of the battery pack? I don't know. I've never run one down. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, the, the instruction manual says you're good for 300 full power pops um, at ISO 200, I think is what it says. Uh, I've, never, I've never run it down, so I haven't shot it on manual for 200 pops at full power. I mean like that, so not sure. Uh, do you use a modeling light or does it drain your batteries? On location, I almost never use a modeling light. I, I know what the light's gonna do. I, I kinda have done this now long enough where I, have, I know the placement. 
Uh, with the travel packs, you can't use your modeling. It, it turns off the modeling light for you. You can't use the modeling light with the travel packs. Some brands you can. Uh, did you change the color temperature at any time? Nope, I didn't. I never changed the color temperature, not if my exposure is based on those lights. It wouldn't change if I was on location or if I'm in the studio. My color temperature stayed the same. So they're very consistent. Uh, boy, you, there's still a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> How many assistants do you usually use? Usually one. Uh, sometimes I'll have two, depending on the job, but usually one. And then there's an awful lot of work I can do by myself. Everything that I use, all my stands and my reflectors and every clips and clamps, there's clamps and clips for everything to mount on a stand and, and will help me. Having the pocket wizard uh, module in my meter is a great savings for me because I can walk over to my subject at any time and fire off my light and check my meter. I can do that myself. I don't need an assistant for that. Um, sometimes I'll take an assistant because of two things. One, helping me carry gear. But the second is I need another set of eyes that I trust. And most of the assistants that I work with that know me and know me pretty well, my favorite guy in, in Texas, Rob Hull, I love Rob. Rob knows me, and Rob is, he's probably a better, much better photographer than I am. Uh, Rob knows how I think, and if I start to say, oh, I need to, Rob's already on his way to do it. He already knew what I was going to do next. And I think that's the beauty of working with a good assistant. They'll make you look great in front of your client, and they'll help you be more efficient on the set. So assistants are very, very crucial. Um, I know around here in the, in the studios here, the Mac Group's main studios here in New York, I know that they've got about four, student, uh, four assistants that they like to work with, and these guys are good. They're, they're on top of it. Um, so, um, what if you have a group of athletes instead of just one? How do you measure the light? Same exact way. I'm going to measure the light. I'm going to go to the one on the front right. Let's say I'm doing a, a team shot, and I've got 15 members of the team. Uh, I'll go to the front row and I'll measure one side and I'll measure the middle and I'll measure the other end. Then I'll measure the back row and I'll measure the middle and measure the other end. And I will move, and in that case I'm going to flat light that anyway, uh, or at least have it more than one light source. And I'm going to raise those lights up on the sides and maybe on the end a little bit higher to reach the back row and then light the front row. And I'll just tweak my lights until all the, my exposures are consistent. My, my meter has to be consistent all the way across when I do a group or I'm in trouble. And like I say, we're, we're probably going to do a webinar on group photography because this is something that does come up a lot. But I do have this course coming up on Kelby One as well. Um, I know this, too. I, I did a, a, a shoot years ago with my friend Terry Deglow from Kodak uh, at the United Nations of all the world leaders, and it was a, the Millennial Summit meeting. And it was the best, biggest shot I've ever done in my career, and certainly I'll never beat that. But the question that came out of that from one of my students was, You've got people wearing white suits and black suits. You've got white skin and black skin. You've got all these variations of tones. How can you, how can you possibly make good exposure with all those variations? And the answer is very, very simple. The answer is that you have to base your exposure on the, on the amount of light that is present, not the tonality of your subject. So let that soak in for a second. If, if, I've got, if I'm photographing a black car, I can't change exposure because the car is black. If it's black, it should look black. If the car is white, it should look white. If the skin is dark, it should look dark. If the skin is light, it should look light. I have to use my meter toward my light and do what the meter tells me and, and build up the exposure to where I want to shoot. But, but I, have to, I can't change that based on the tonality of my subject. So in the group photography situation, it's the same thing. I've got to light it in such a way that at least I've got even lighting across. Um, and then whatever the meter says, that's what I'm going to do. That's my, that's, that's my rule. Um, uh, do you ever consider cupo stands? Absolutely. And I've got a six-pack of cupo stands. Uh, and I'll usually, for something like this, I could have taken those out and probably would have been safer for me to take the cupo C stands with me on this location and then set weights on those. <clears throat> Pardon me. But I just use the kit lights that came, the kit stands that came with my, with my Bones Gemini kits. Uh, it was just easier to manhandle up and down all the stairs to get to the field. Um, can you go over what you said earlier about your exposure for ambient light? Yeah, so, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, okay, so, yeah, let me go over that. <laughs> it's so weird when she sends me these questions and I'm looking at them, it's like, ah, they, they move and change. It's pretty odd. <laughs> you're, you're good. Um, so, so to answer that one, earlier what I said was basically this. With regard to the exposure, 
you have to determine what you want the brightness value to be of the background in particular. And so if the background brightness is a bright sunny day, I know, I want to, I know I'm going to shoot. If I'm at 125 ISO, it's going to be 125 at F16. That's my exposure, period. Then I'll bring my lights up to F16 to match that. Now, if I want that background to appear a little darker, then I can cheat my shutter speed up a little bit or I can slow it down a little bit and vary the density of my background based solely on my shutter speed. So it, it works just like that. It's pretty simple. So um, what color temperature? Uh, if, I'm a, if I'm in daylight situation, I use daylight. <laughs> you know, it just works. Um, the flash setting on your camera on the presets is ideally suited for your speed lights. Speed lights by nature are a little bit cooler temperature than your strobes, studio strobes. So it's probably three to 500 uh, Kelvin degrees temperature cooler. So that flash setting on your camera will add three to 500 degrees Kelvin warmth into your picture. Uh, if you like a little bit of warmth in your work, in your portrait work, and you're in the studio, maybe don't set to daylight, but maybe set to flash, and it might, you might see just a little hit of warmth, and you might like it. You might not, but, uh, but it is something that's pretty good to, to utilize. And then finally, if just starting out, what would you consider a good one light system to build on? 400 watt seconds minimum or higher? 400 is great. I was talking earlier about that little 400 RX kit that we have, uh, the Gemini two head kit. This is a two head kit, <clears throat> 400 watt second heads, which are great. We use them all day, the last two days, three days around here. Two head kit with two stands and two umbrellas and two reflectors and a carrying case with wheels on it. And the whole kit it retails for 850 bucks. Um, I don't think you can do better and have more powerful lights, more powerful controls, and have higher quality for anywhere near that kind of money. So I think it's a great way to, uh, I think it's a great way to start. Um, and then finally, I want to just wrap up one of the last questions here was, will Bowen have LED strobes? Not sure about if we'll have LED strobes or if we do, when we'll see them. Um, through our relationship with Bowens in the UK and their building of lights called Limelight, we do have LED lighting. And, and around the studio here, some of the guys that do some of the product work, they really like those lights, the, the SLED lights especially, S-L-E-D. It's S-L-E-D, Studio LED Lights, are, are really great lights. And there's something to consider taking a look at. And you can get batteries for those uh, for taking them off on location. We've also got one called the Mosaic, which is a one-by-one one square uh, LED lights, which are very, very bright, very durable. Uh, so they're pretty worthwhile and worth checking out. So, well, you guys have, uh, have we've we've run this right up to a full hour already, haven't we? <laughs> we we got on a good roll there. Uh, let me just see if there's anything left there that I didn't I didn't I don't want to skip any anything that's important there. Um, I think we're caught up. Let me just let me just wrap up by saying, you know, we our job here is to inform. I think. Um, We'd love it if you'll go buy some Bowens lights. But if you don't, that's okay too. Come back anyway. We're going to continue to inform. Uh, our, my job as, as the lighting evangelist for the company, and, and I've been doing light workshops uh, for 25 years, and, I, and lighting is what I do. It's what I love to do. It's what I love to talk about more than anything. Uh, the TeamBowens.com blog that we've started is very, very active, and every day, we're, every, every week, we're posting one or two things new all about light control. So stay tuned, and thanks for, thanks for tuning in there for sure. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel at uh, Bowens TV on YouTube.com. Uh, and subscribe to it, and you'll get notifications when we post something new. Well, folks, again, thanks. Uh, you know, we, we try to do this uh, as often as we can. We, we've got some great, great things. We had a meeting this morning with some great webinar ideas coming up for next year. Uh, we've got a lot of content coming, coming your way sooner than later. So stay with us. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for trusting us. And, uh, and I hope it's, it's been helpful for you. Um, feel free to send us a note. Um, you're welcome to send us notes anytime. We take criticism well, and we actually read everything that comes in. So we hope that, that you'll continue doing that. Uh, again, thanks very much. Have a great week, and uh, appreciate you tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.